So, thanks for the invitation and special thanks to the CREI team, so, which organized the Sustainability Week at the University of Basel. It is so important to support sustainable development. And you created really a very interesting program this week and also this evening. <laughs> so congratulations, I'm really impressed. And I want to welcome you to my presentation on the sustainable or unsustainable water governance in Switzerland. And I'm happy to share some insights of my research with you. So my name is Elke Kellner and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute for forest, snow, and landscape in Zurich. So in the beginning, I want to invite you to answer some questions about your opinion regarding dams in Switzerland. And with that, I want to start with Paul. Okay. Hopefully you can see it and please answer this one question. <laughs> Okay, I will finish the poll. And we can have a look at the results. So that's, we don't need, okay, that's very interesting. I think um, we have many different opinions uh, in our Zoom meeting today and I'm looking forward to our discussion after the presentation. So. so, as all of you know, the United Nations member states adopted in 2015 the Sustainable Development Goals, so the SDGs. These are 17 goals. And today we want to focus on SDG 6. <clears throat> the water goal. However, we will see in the next minutes that this goal interacts also with many other goals of the SDGs. So goal six aims to ensure the av availability and sustainable management of water for all. And target 6.4 aims an efficient water allocation and use and target 6.6 .6, healthy water system ecosystems. So why does goal six exist? What is the background of that goal? One in three people live currently without safe drinking water. And by 2025, half of the global population will be living in areas where water is scarce. So what are the reasons for water scarcity? <clears throat> you heard some aspects in our last presentation um, and Professor Kam also said, we have a problem because of climate change. So that's um, first climate change has an impact on water supply. And I will give you also some more information of that in the next minutes. But also um, socioeconomic changes lead to changes in water demand. And he also mentioned that with agriculture and so on. Um, and these changes are improving living standards, changing consumption patterns, as you mentioned. So these are, for example, the food and your clothes with, um, which need water for production. Perhaps you know the water footprint, but also economic growth. So which leads to rising income and therefore we have more money for consumption and also increasing world population. And the changing diets and the growing population leads, as he mentioned, to the expansion of irrigated agriculture. But third and very important is that water scarcity is also a result of failed water governance. And 
again, I want to do a short survey um, uh, because I'm interested when whether you have already experienced water scarcity in Switzerland or elsewhere. So. I have the next one. So. Oh, now we have more than 90%. Perhaps we will get 100%. <laughs> okay, very interesting. I will share the results with you. So, more people of you have experience with water scarcity, but not in Switzerland. So, we will come to that later. So, that's really interesting. And I will give you now some insights about water scarcity also in Switzerland. So you can get an impression of the situation in Switzerland. We can see on the picture seasonal, but also regional water scarcity. So on that picture, you can see the Swiss army, which brings water for cows on an alp in the mountains. And as we heard in the last presentation, climate change has an impact on the water balance in Switzerland. So climate change has an impact on glaciers, on snow, on precipitation, on runoff in the rivers, and on evapotranspiration. So let's have a look into more detail on the impact of climate change. So it has an impact on the natural water storages, such as glaciers and snow, but also on precipitation. So this leads to hydrological effects with the changing runoff. That means a different amount of water in the rivers and in the groundwater, and it increases the risk of droughts. And in consequence, the changing runoff have social ecological effects because it changed the availability of water for domestic uses, for agricultural uses and industrial uses, but also biodiversity. So, and I want to start now with some information on glaciers, snow and precipitation in Switzerland. So on the left side, you can see the changes in the ice volume of all the alpine glaciers by the end of the century. Without climate change mitigation, 95% of the current glacier volume will have melted by the end of the century. On the right side, you can see simulation, uh, simulations of the retreating Alec glacier. You can see how natural lakes evolve instead of the glaciers. And this is an example of the Canton of Bern, of the Drift Glacier in the Bernese Oberland. On the left side, you can see the glacier 70 years before. And on the right side, you can see the new natural lake in front of the retreating uh, glacier. But climate change has also an impact on snow. So we will face less snow depth and a less snow duration and a more frequent and more intense melt of snow. And it has also impact of um, precipitation. So Professor Kam said there's a lot of uh, insecurities uh, currently, but these are now uh, the really newest um, models. And they were presented two weeks ago at a conference. And um, I think it's still, there is a kind of uncertainty, but we, the modelers really think that the water will decrease, uh, increase in winter by 
um, in the summer precipitation will have a decrease of 20%. What is clear because of the temperature is overall precip precipitation will be more in the form of rain rather than snow. So hopefully you have now more information on the upper part of the figure and let's come to the hydrological effects. So the impact on glacier, snow and precipitation have effects on the runoff. So runoff is the amount of water in the rivers, but also the groundwater. So the figure on the left side is a little bit more complicated, but what we can see is that the alpine regions with, with glaciers showed a higher runoff in the last years. And that is clear because the glaciers are currently melting and then we have a higher runoff. Whereas all other regions show a decrease in runoff. And as an example, in your region, the monthly runoff of the Rhine at Basel will change significantly by the end of the century if no climate change mitigation takes place. Okay, coming back to our figure. And now we will have a look at the social ecological effects of the hydrological changes. First of all, a lower runoff and resulting higher temperature will have a huge impact on aquatic ecosystems. For example, it will decrease native species and increase non-native species. It will lead to a decrease of specialists and an increase of generalists. And biodiversity will decrease in general. This is a picture in 2019 where experts had to fish out brown droughts, Bach forellen, from the Ballenbach that's in the canton of Luzern. However, the changing runoff has also an impact on agriculture. So, because as we heard before, um, usually farmers take their water for irrigation from groundwater or from rivers and water canals. And you can see on the figure that pumping water for irrigation was restricted in Switzerland in 2015, but also in 2018 in many regions. And that has a huge impact on food production. And as you can Im Im imagine, low runoff has also an impact on shipping. You can see an example in 2018 when Rhine shipping was limited. And last but not least, it has also impacts on households. I think these are not very important issues, of course, to irrigate the garden or to wash the car at home. Um, yeah, but it's only to show how it affects different water uses. So what can we do? In general, three approaches exist to respond to water scarcity. The first one is to increase water supply. The second one is to manage the demand side. And the third one is to reallocate the water. So what does that mean exactly? Technologies and infrastructure can help to increase water supply. So for example, we can build dams and distribution systems such as water canals, as you can see on the picture. This facilitates the storage of water and the distribution of water among users. But what we can observe is that policy reforms and government investments focus largely on supply set solutions and ignore the paradox of increasing water supply. Because increasing water supply may initially address water scarcity, but it also enables higher water demand. And then in consequence, the increasing water uses can lead to levels that cannot be sustained through dry periods. So this situation can offset the initial benefit of supply augmentation. Therefore, demand side management is also very important and aims to limit water consumption. It includes, for example, regulations. In Switzerland, concessions regulate how much water can be used for which purpose. So concessions exist for hydropower production, but also for irrigation. But demand side management includes also behavioral interventions. So farmers can change to drought resistant plants. You as a consumer, you can change your diet. You can reduce your water footprint of your food. And demand side management includes also incentives, planning processes, education, and so on. Water reallocation means to change patterns of water use. 
For example, if a concession for a hydropower dam reservoir expires, so it means it's, it's finished, the new granted concession could include other uses such as irrigation or water for ecological systems. Fortunately, most concessions of the large reservoirs in the Swiss Alps expire in the next years. You can see on the figure at the right side all the Swiss Alpine dams where the concession will expire in the next year. So they are finished and then that is the great opportunity to integrate new water uses and downstream water uses in the new concessions. So you are now familiar with the cascading effects on the left side and what can we do to mitigate that cascading effects? We have to mitigate climate change and simultaneously we have to adapt to the consequences of climate change. So what does that mean? One potential strategy to cope with these challenges is the construction of new water reservoirs. Or as I showed on the last slide, we can change the concessions of existing reservoirs. And the concessions need to account for various water uses. So reservoirs can produce hydropower, which contributes to mitigation of climate change. In addition, reservoirs can store water in the wet season and release water in the dry and high demand season. So in consequence, this can lead to higher water availability for domestic use, for agricultural use, and so on, but also for biodiversity. So on the next slide, I will give you an example in Switzerland, Switzerland of such a potential cascade. So perhaps you know that the Bernese hydropower company, Kraftwerk of Oberhasli, plans to build a new hydropower dam in front of the retreating Drift Glacier. You already know this picture, but now you can see on the, the planned dam on the right side of the picture. So the hydropower company and the canton organized a broad participatory process together with environmental NGOs, local municip municipalities, political representatives, and so on. And in that process, they negotiated the issues of the hydropower concession. So the process started in 2012. And in 2017, they submitted the draft of the concession to the canton. And as all of you know, we had a nuclear reactor accident in Fukushima in 2011. In response to that, the Swiss federal government devised a new national, national energy strategy. And in this strategy, one pillar is to increase renewable energy, of course, <laughs> and in particular, hydropower production. And the public vote on that strategy was in 2017. So this context is important for the understanding of the process and the decisions made in the process. So all actors wanted to support the new energy strategy and to increase renewable energy. So during the process, the ecological effects of the new dam were analyzed in detail. And furthermore, the actors negotiated the compensatory measures for this hydropower project. And after five years, they achieved a broad consensus with most of the actors. So they decided to use the, the dam and the water in the dam only for hydropower and not for any other use except um, residual water. These are very specific words. So, however, some actors still protest against this project. They organize different events in the region and a protest camp in front of the retreating glacier, as you can see on the picture. So they really want to conserve this location. They were against the dam. Okay, coming back to the concession, which was negotiated in the participatory process. And our results showed that it was a very good organized and very good designed process. However, they did not discuss any downstream water use. Of course, they have to respect residual water, but there was no discussion or coordination with any other downstream water uses. And so let's have a look at the downstream cascade. In the upper alpine part on the left side, um, there's this drift reservoir. And then the water flows down the Aare in the Puyenza See and the Tuna See, and at the end, it flows into the Rhine. 
In between, we have important aquatic habitats in, in the Seeland. The farmers use the water for irrigation. If the Trift Reservoir should provide water in dry summers for aquatic ecosystems and irrigation, we must know more about the volumes. So the plant reservoir will have a volume of 85 million cubic meters of water. And the current inflow per year is 100 million cubic meters of water. And even though the lakes have large volumes, the usable volume has more or less the same volume than the storage capacity of the Trift Reservoir. And this is because of they have very specific lake regulations for the Prienza Sea and Tuna Sea, but also because of hyd uh, hydraulic limitations. So now, as you can see on the slide now, <laughs> I try to um, show it a little bit. So it, perhaps now it's better understandable. I mean, the lake cannot release water if the lake level is below the river, of course. So this usable volume is, yeah, it's around the same storage capacity like the reservoir. So the exact irrigation volumes in the Seeland region are not known. Probably they have a volume of around 20 million cubic meters of water. So what does that mean? The Trift Reservoir could store water in the wet season and could dis discharge water in dry seasons. And this would lead to higher runoff and then would have a positive effect on aquatic ecosystems and the farmers could use the water for irrigation. But it would also lead to less hydropower production in dry years because hydropower is mainly produced in winter. So furthermore, the various political backgrounds are important in understanding these coordination problems. So new hydropower dams are supported as we have seen by the Swiss energy strategy. And they give subsidies, subvention, and they really support it very much. So to reach the goals of the energy strategy has currently high importance. And the actors argue that we need more hydropower production to ensure energy security, because we want to phase out also nuclear energy. However, as you can imagine, new dams have a huge impact on local biodiversity. But also, hydropower production mitigate climate change on a global level. And this, in turn, has a positive effect on biodiversity locally. So it's really complicated, and the biodiversity strategy is also affected. However, Switzerland has also a tourism strategy and a strategy for food security. So as I already mentioned, uh, they did not include downstream water uses in the concession. And so what are the main factors for this decision? First, there was the strong interest of all actors to produce more renewable energy and to phase out nuclear energy. Some of the actors had strong econ economic interests because the reservoir will get paid by around 40% through subsidies from the Swiss energy strategy. And the actors of the participatory process, that's really, yeah, I can't imagine, but they were not aware of future downstream water scarcity. It's still this narrative in Switzerland that we are the water castle. And yeah. So in addition, a strong narrative exists that the large lakes have enough water to compensate low runoff. And the farmers in the Seeland have another narrative, they think, to have unlimited water resources in Zeeland for irrigation. So they told me in the interview that the Aare have unlimited water resources. So however, hydrological models have shown the Aare will have seasons with low runoff in future. And there is a potential of this alpine reservoirs to mitigate downstream water scarcity. So the consequences of this lacking coordination are the following the production of renewable energy is high. Of course, the reservoir will contribute to the Swiss energy security with renewable energy. And the hydropower company can produce energy when they get high prices on the European energy market. On the other side, in dry summers, the lake levels and the runoff of the Aare could be low. This can have consequences for aquatic ecosystems, shipping, 
on the lakes and pumping of water for irrigation could be restricted with consequences for food production. And to make the story complete, let's say, uh, what would be the consequences if they would have integrated downstream water uses in the concession? So the production of renewable energy would be lower, of course, because the reservoir will release water in dry season and not in winter. They could contribute with a lower amount, amount of energy to the energy security. Furthermore, it is less financially attractive for the hydropower company. And it needs really clarified who should pay for the water for ecosystems, but also who should pay for the water for irrigation, the farmers? We still don't know. There's no discussion about these topics currently. However, this reservoir management would have positive consequences for the lake levels and the runoff of the Aare, and this would have positive consequences for aquatic ecosystems, shipping on the lakes and irrigation. So as we have seen, there are difficult trade-offs between climate change mitigation and adaptation. Do we want to produce more renewable energy or to provide more water for aquatic ecosystems and other uses such as irrigation? So what is the current state of research and of current plans in Switzerland? Swiss researchers, so Farinotti et colleagues, modeled for the European Alps where dams could replace glaciers. But they conclude at the end that new reservoirs are not the only solution. Alternative strategies for more efficient management of water resources are required. So another study of uh, Swiss research, uh, this are Erba and colleagues, they studied the best location for new hydropower dams in the Swiss Alps. And you can see on the map, so that they identified the Aletsch Glacier, Grindelwald, Rhone, and so on. They are good locations for new hydropower dams. And the federal offices started last summer a roundtable to discuss with stakeholders from the hydropower sector and with environmental NGOs options for new hydropower dams in the Swiss Alps. But again, there are no actors involved from the agricultural sector, um, for example. So based on this situation, I will give you in the last part of my, in my last minutes um, of my presentation, some ideas and conclusions. What I think is important for sustainable water governance in Switzerland. So first of all, if new reservoirs will be constructed or new concessions will be granted, they should integrate downstream water uses. The concession for a new dam is usually granted for 80 years and we have seen in the beginning, at the end of the century, we will face more water scarcity due to climate change. So that needs to be integrated in the concession. So therefore, the responsible actors need to have a higher awareness of the cascading effects of new hydropower dams, because the dams can aggravate the situation for downstream water users, because they produce energy mostly in winter, and then store the water in summer. And this can lead to more water scarcity in, in droughts in summer and less runoff. So, and then other recommendations would be that the subsidies for hydropower reservoirs should only be granted if the reservoir considers downstream water uses. And it would be good to do a national potential analysis. And this should be conducted with priority sites for new reservoirs. Because if we have a national overview, this would prevent the uncontrolled construction of new reservoirs with impacts on nature, biodiversity, and landscape. It's really important also landscape. I never mentioned that before. <laughs> and this would mitigate the pressure on the cantons to contribute to the Swiss energy strategy with new reservoirs. And for my last conclusion, we have to go back to the three approaches to respond to how to respond to water scarcity. So based on what I have presented before, we conclude that new Alpine reservoirs would be a supply augmentation. It increases the supply, water supply. To develop new regulations for existing Alpine reservoirs follows two approaches. 
the supply augmentation and also water reallocation. So it would reallocate the water for hydro, from hydropower production, for example, for irrigation. But the third and very important piece of the puzzle is demand management. Downstream water uses need to be regulated and limited uh, to avoid this paradox of a higher water demand due to higher water supply. So therefore, my last recommendation is to follow a system approach. We should not only increase the supply with dams or reallocate the water, we have also managed the demand side. <laughs> and that is my last slide. Um, as we have seen, new dams and the cascade influences not only goal six, it influences also life on land, life below water and clean energy. And with that, I want to conclude. If we want to achieve sustainable development, we have to think in systems and we have to acknowledge the interactions between the SDGs. We have seen to, re the, to reach the goal seven, so to pr produce clean energy with hydropower. This interacts with other goals like water, life below water, below water, life on land. So we have to acknowledge the whole system and we have to use a system approach where we understand and take into account the whole system. Otherwise it could lead to detrimental effects on sustainable development. And with that, I will finish my presentation and want to open a discussion